Hi, and thanks for joining us for another Quick Hit by Complete Intelligence. I'm Tracy Schuchart, and today we're talking about inflation versus deflation with Stephen Van Meter and Peter Bookbar. But before we jump into that, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You two are very popular and well-known in the finance community and on FinTwit, but for those who may not know you, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Stephen, you can go first. Sure. Thanks, Tracy. I'm Steve Van Meter. I'm a money manager. I've invented a strategy called Portfolio Shield, and I have a somewhat popular YouTube show that we discuss uh, economic data and the news uh, three days a week. Great. And Peter? Uh, I'm Peter Bookfor. I'm the uh, Chief Investment Officer and Portfolio Manager of Weekly Advisory Group. And I have a, a daily macro slash market economic newsletter called The Book Report. Excellent. So really, I kind of want to start broadly here. So if you could give me like your two minute elevator pitch on your view on whether, you know, you're an inflationist or deflationist, even though we already know who is who um, and kind of how fluid is your view. So we could go start with Peter on this one. So if we just break down inflation as just the simple too much money chasing too few goods, uh, we certainly have too few goods with uh, supply challenges around the world and too much money with a lot of fiscal spending over the past 18 months financed by uh, the Federal Reserve buying uh, most of that debt that the Treasury issued to uh, finance a lot of this fiscal spending. So it's combining with a uh, inflation situation where it's really just the good side that is the part of the debate. Services inflation is rather persistent. For the past 20 years leading into COVID, services inflation X energy has averaged almost 3%, but goods have been basically zero. And it's always that trade-off that has resulted in an inflation rate of one to 2% over the last couple of decades. But now you are back on trend with services inflation. And I'll argue that will accelerate from here because of rents. And now you combine that with a period of goods inflation. Now goods inflation is typically cyclical if, if history is any guide, but how long of a cyclical rise we have uh, really is the question. And I just think it's not going to be so short term that it could last a couple of years. Okay. And um, Stephen? Yeah. So I, I think that the inflation story is going to be more, um, at least the former Fed's view of being tr on the transitory side. And I take that view strictly from my understanding of how the monetary system works, looking at uh, the velocity of money, the fiscal stimulus cliff going away, that uh, while I do agree that Peter will be right and that we will likely see see higher inflation, and I agree in where he thinks it's coming from in terms of the supply chain, I completely agree with that. But I do think ultimately those higher prices will get rejected without a sustained amount of new money coming in from fiscal or other means or from lending growth. And so even though we'll see rising prices and they will probably go up a bit more, ultimately I think the consumer will reject them just like we saw during the great financial crisis and that we are more likely to see uh, inflation turn down pretty hard and perhaps even into deflation. Or one of you can jump in here. Um, so, what kind of where you know where do you see inflation, deflation hitting the soonest and the hardest? And if we're looking at commodities that are still running very hot, <clears throat> supply chains that are very stressed. Um, at what point do you think we see the demand destruction, and how long do you think that we're going to see these extremes in the disruption in supply chains that are causing um, much of this current inflation? Well, we're already seeing some demand responses. I mean, we are, we are seeing a slowdown in, in economic growth. Part of that is a pushback against these price increases. I mean, if you look at the housing market, you know, there's, there's particularly the first time home buyer that has sticker shock and doesn't want to pay for a home that's priced 20% more than it was a year ago. And they're saying, okay, let me, let me take a pause here. Uh, so there is some of that. But then, of course, there's also some 
forced demand destruction because enough product can't be delivered. And that an auto plan has to shut down an assembly line because they can't get enough parts and they're not sure when they're gonna be able to get enough. Or it's Nike that can't deliver enough store uh, product to Foot Locker because it's gonna take 80 days to get it from their factory in Vietnam rather than 40 days. Now, at some point, goods inflation is going to be temporary. The question is, is how long does this take to resolve itself? And one of the things that I, I think will unfold here is that let's just take transportation costs because that is a main factor in the rise in inflation because every single thing that's made in this world ends up on a plane, a ship, a truck, or, or a railroad to get it from point A to point B. So let's just say uh, I'm a toy manufacturer and my transportation costs are now 35% year over year on top of the cost of, of my, my wholesale cost to actually get the product and my cost of labor is up five to 7% year over year. Well, I'm not gonna recoup that all in one shot by raising prices to Walmart by 10%. It's, it could take me a couple of years to recoup that but I'm, I promise you, I'm going to do my best to do so. And I'm going to space that out. So my, and I'm going to try my best to, to cushion the blow to that end buyer who's buying for their kids for Christmas uh, by spacing out that price increase. But I know I'm going to have visibility because everyone else is going to be doing the same thing for the next, call it three years in raising prices so I can recapture, I may not be able to regain completely, but recapture some of my lost profit margin. So that's one of the reasons why I think this is going to be sticky. And to Steve's point, yes, there's going to be a, a fiscal fall off next year to some extent. Uh, we'll see how much of the lost transfer payments are going to be offset by both the, the child tax money plus people going back to work. We saw jobless claim have a two handle today for the first time since uh, pre-COVID. And to what extent wage increases can offset the rise in the cost of living. And yeah, we'll have to see that. But the question is, is how much do prices come back in? You take lumber, for example, and, I, and I'll, I'll give it to Steve right after this. Lumber prices in the heart of the housing bowl in the mid-2000s was about $300. Now it's, it's, it went up to $1,600, now it's about $650. Well, the cost of a home, construction-wise, and what, they, what a, a builder would charge their customer is not going back to where it was. They are going to use this and fatten their margin as best they can. And it's going to take years for that buyer to experience what is truly reflected at 650 lumber, but that's even more than double where it was. So it's still multiple years of price increases that are going to flow through the chain. Yeah. You know, Peter, you bring up some absolutely excellent points about how long this could go. And that's something I really haven't considered that it could run a couple of years because I look at this fiscal cliff and to me, it, you go back to the pandemic and you, we know all this ending was driven by fiscal stimulus and without it. And I know we still have the child tax credit for a, a bit. I'm just concerned that this drop off comes a lot stronger than most people are expecting. And I, I do realize a lot of these you know, goods are sitting off ports, waiting to get you know shipped in, waiting for truckers to take them to, to warehouses and eventually onto stores. The question I keep asking is, when those goods hit the shelves, will consumers be there with money? Do they have the money to spend? Are they going to go back to work fast enough? And even though, as you mentioned, we hit a two handle today, we both know that that's almost 50% higher than normal. So the, so the question is, you know, we still see these huge amount of job openings everywhere. We're not seeing people go back to work. We saw the jolt state. I know you looked at that uh, recently uh, from the other day where people are quitting their jobs. And so I keep coming back to the same question is, will consumers come and spend and keep these prices up? If they don't, then we get the reversal. But that's my question is, do they come? I mean, it, it's it's a great it's a great question of whether that will be the case. 
I don't think the labor market is going back to where it was pre-COVID. And all you have to do is look at the participation rate to confirm that, particularly for the age group of 25 to 54 year olds, which is sort of the core wage earning population. And it's still well below where it was in, in February 2020. So yeah, yeah, we're not going back to a three and a half percent unemployment rate with the same number of employed people anytime soon. Now, what is replacing a lot of the lost sort of or not made up fiscal money that has been spent, particularly December uh, 2020 with, with, with Trump's last fiscal package and then repeated just a few months later with Biden is that I mentioned we do have that child tax money that's going out. We do have an increase in food stamps. Uh, basically, that, that reservation wage, which is basically the, the wage level at which someone has a tough choice of whether do they go take that job or do they collect all that government handout, that continues to go up. So that person who may not want to go back to work, well, they're getting a lot of benefits elsewhere. And while the, in the aggregate, we're going to probably see some sort of fiscal drop off. Um, the question is, 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 what, is, is that enough from the demand side to offset um, what's going on in the supply side? Now, again, supply side is going to normalize at some point. There's no question about it. Just a matter of when. I mean, Taiwan Semi is spending billions of dollars uh, that just broke ground in June in Arizona to build a semi plant. Well, it's not going to be done until 2024. Now, there could be uh, a lot of double ordering, triple ordering that's going on in semis right now. We're going to have this major inventory hangover. We're already actually seeing it in DRAM, for example. Uh, and, and, and that could happen. And there's going to be a mess at the other end of this. It just, I just think that this drags out. And also, a key part of this inflation debate, too, is in, the, in what context is this coming in? If we had a Fed funds rate in the US of 3%, if we had a 10 year at four to five, if we didn't have such thing as negative interest rates, I'd say, you know what, the world can handle a bout of higher inflation because interest rates are higher. If equity valuations weren't as extreme as they are and they were more in line with history, I would say, okay, we can absorb it. But that's not the case right now. We have valuations that are excessive in a variety of different things. Obviously, we have zero interest rates, negative interest rates, Q, and so on. So even if inflation decelerated to, let's just say, a 3% rate for a year or two, I just don't think that the world is positioned for that. Yeah, and I, I'm see, I'm not worried about the upper 50%. I'm, I'm really curious about the bottom 50%, who was really the big recipients. I mean, I know a lot of people got the, the fiscal checks, but you know, I, I, my wife's a fourth grade teacher, and one of the problems they're having in schools right now, and you, you've probably been hearing about this, is a kid or a staff or a teacher gets COVID, and next thing you know, they're quarantining out you know segments of the classroom. They're sending them home, and the parents are really struggling with this because they want to go back to work, but then all of a sudden, next thing you know, their kid's back, and they can't. And so they're forced to stay at home and they don't have you know the family support maybe they don't want to send a kid to grandma and grandpa because they don't want them to get sick in case their kid has it and so i keep wondering without all this fiscal support from the government is the natural expectation as particularly with higher energy prices as we go into the winter that these cash strapped households are going to ultimately make the choice to you know well i've got to buy food we all know that's gone up we have to pay for energy we know that's gone up um, as Peter, as you mentioned earlier, that rents are probably going up. So what does that leave in terms of discretionary income to spend to drive inflation? And I kind of wonder is, you know, without their spending power, how is this going to last? And that's my big concern is I don't think it does. I think consumers are going to inject it. I don't think they have the income. I don't think the money supply is growing fast enough. And then you start looking at the dollar and interest rates and you, know, you would want to see the dollar going down. You want to see interest rates going up. And we keep seeing the dollar fighting to go higher. We keep seeing interest rates trying to press back lower. And it's telling us that financial conditions are tight. And of course, the Fed's you know, potentially about to taper and start to remove their support of that. And I just keep kind of shaking my head going like, how are we going to get through the holiday season unless consumers come out and spend a big way? I'm just not convinced. 
Well, is there, well, you perfect segue into what I kind of wanted to get into next was um, talking about the Fed tapering. So first, because um, everybody's talking about this. Um, and so where do you, do you see the Fed tapering? And if they do, how much is this going to affect inflation? And also, I know the market is saying the Fed's going to raise rates in 22, 23, but is this a reality at all? <laughs> 